strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, our God, who reigns forever. Comfort those in me. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. We raise forever our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint. Welcome to church this week. We're all super stoked to have you here. We just wanted to say a special welcome to those who are new or visiting and welcome back to our regular church goers. My name's Keely, and I am super stoked that we are still able to have church going, even if it is online and even if we can't see each other. I've been encouraged every week watching church online. All right, so before we start our actual church service, I wanna begin by asking you all a question. So we all know that in isolation, there's only so much we can really do to keep ourselves entertained before we get dead bored. I want to know the most crazy, outlandish, random thing you've done to keep yourself entertained during isolation. For me personally, about a month ago, I decided to shave my hair off. I don't regret it yet, but I'm really looking forward to that stage where it grows out and it's a little bit awkward. I'm really hoping for all your sake that we're back at church for that so we can all enjoy it together. Anyway, I'm going to give you a little bit of time in the comments to write down the most crazy wild thing you've done to keep yourself entertained in isolation. All right, go.
Great, I hope someone else has shaved their head too so I'm not on my own. Anyway, this week at church, we're starting a new book called One Peter. Now, Peter wrote this book to several churches around his area who were being badly treated by the Romans. And they were going through all types of trials and suffering at this time. And Peter wrote this letter to encourage them and to remind them that they have a steadfast hope in God, which I think is so timely for this time right now where we don't really know what's going on and all we can do is lean on God. So I'm really excited to start this letter this week and I really hope that you guys are all both challenged and encouraged by what we're going to hear. Also, for those who haven't tuned in yet, our church has a podcast called Rhythms Podcast. This week, Mitch and Ben are going to be talking about One Peter. Now, personally, I have found this podcast to be really helpful as it goes through all types of different topics that help you grow um, as a Christian during this time. It helps you start really helpful patterns um, to keep going even after coronavirus and isolation has ended. Now, I reckon that this week's one is going to be particularly helpful as it will couple well with the sermons that we're going through. So if you want to know more or just be encouraged throughout the week, this podcast is great for you. It's available on both Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. And if you want further resources, just go onto the St. Faith's website, click on the Rhythms tab, and there'll be some daily Bible journals for you to partner with this podcast. Also, if you're interested, we have a monthly prayer diary that comes out and you're welcome to partner with us through prayer by using that. That will be available if you click the link in the notes section above. Thank you so much. All right, and on that note, we're gonna to pray together as a church community. So please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather today. Father, we thank you that you sustain us every day, especially through hard times, like we have been experiencing. We pray for all those, both known and unknown to us, who have contracted coronavirus. We pray that you may keep them safe and give the doctors guidance and support. Father, we pray too for the scientists who are developing a vaccine. We pray that, it, if, that if it is your will, that they will be able to develop and test that efficiently. Lord, we thank you so much for your provision at this time. God, we praise you for the technologies that have been made available to us so that we are able to connect and proclaim your name throughout our online gatherings. Father, we pray for Ben as he preaches today, that you will speak through him and help him to speak clearly. And we pray for everyone listening that they may have open hearts and minds to your gospel. We pray that we might be able to bring glory to Christ in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so now Neil is gonna come and talk to us about the Cottage Counseling Centre and all the great things that they do. G'day everyone, my name is Neil Suter, I'm one of the ministers uh, here at St Faith's and today we've got Jen Lakos here uh, from the Cottage Counselling Centre and she's the director of the Cottage Counselling Centre, so it's great to have you here Jen. Thanks Neil. Hey, uh, hey Jen, tell us a little bit about the Cottage Counselling Centre. Thanks Neil, thanks. Yeah, the Cottage Counselling Centre uh, is a group of, a team of 14 counsellors and psychologists, all Christians. Uh, we work out of six different churches. Uh, on the Lower North Shore and uh, Northern Beaches. We're in Narrabeen, DY, Manly, Belrose, Crow's Nest and Linfield. We keep growing. Yeah, wow. And uh, yeah, we, we've been around for 24 years helping people. Uh, and tell you what, the cottage has been doing an amazing job uh, in, our, in our church, in our communities. It's so good to have you guys there. Hey, um, Jen, as you reflect on everything that's been going on over, over the last you know, month and, month or so, um, uh, what's some things that God's been teaching you? Look, I think this is such a good question now. So I've been thinking about it and I think for me, one of the most important things is knowing that I'm not alone. Mm. I think because it does bring up anxiety. I think we're in crisis and it brings up a lot of anxiety for all of us. And I think knowing that God is with me. I, th I come back to the picture of Jesus calming the storm. Jesus in the boat calming the storm. Hmm. I think it's Luke 8, 
25 to 28, it's somewhere around there. And, and Jesus comes a storm. And I think it's not the fact that when we pray, he's going to take things away, but it's the fact that he's with us in it. And mm. I think that's what's been really important to me. I know that Jesus is with me in the boat. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a really good image, isn't it? Jesus is, is with us. Uh, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, yeah. I, I love I love that image. Hey, um, we we often hear at this time um, the media uh, using things like unprecedented times, uh, challenging times. Uh, from a from a counsellor's perspective, uh, what things are you particularly concerned about uh, in these times? Mm. They're scary words, aren't they? Yeah. They bring fear up. As soon as you hear those words, I mm. think you start to feel fearful, mm. unprecedented times. And I think as counsellors, we're acutely aware of obviously mental health in our community. Yep. We're really aware of the pain that people are going through with anxiety and stress and fear and depression. And it's very concerning. And I think it's, it's realising that people, they can't do the things they normally would to manage their anxiety, to manage their depression. They can't get to the gym, they can't get to the beach, they can't go to the club, they can't meet with their friends and have dinner. There's all these things they can't do to manage their anxiety. And I think that, that becomes quite troubling. We, um, yeah, I think, I think we've been quite concerned to make sure that people are not actually um, social isolating, that they're physically isolating physically distancing, but socially connecting in whatever ways they can. Mm. People are doing that creatively and I think we're concerned about that. I think the other thing is um, domestic violence. Yep. Harder to find a safer place, a safe place. Mm. I think, um, and maybe just one of the important things to say is that those services are still in operation. Yep, right. And, um, and so please give us a ring at the cottage if you need to talk to someone about that. If you need to connect with someone, please give us a ring. Mm. Yeah, like you're saying, there's uh, a lot of us are stuck indoors. Um, you know, we're trying to juggle work, we're trying to juggle uh, homeschooling for kids. Um, we're just hanging to get outside and get back to normal routines, and but but we can't at the moment. Um, how can? What are some uh, practical tips on looking after our mental health? Yeah, yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? It's um, you know, everyone is being impacted by this. The people who are feeling isolated, but there are people who've lost jobs, their uh, businesses have gone down, and there's families who are all trying to work from home, homeschool. Yep. It's, I don't think our houses were made for that, really, were they? <laughs> <laughs> we're all trying to use the same internet. We're all using devices. It's, it's a bit crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's the frustrations. I think it's, um, it's difficult. And I think really one of the things is we need to show each other a lot of grace. Maybe think before we speak, mm. uh, before, before we speak to each other, before we say that next thing out of frustration, to think before we do that. If, if everyone is trying to work at home, to keep some sort of routine I think is a good idea. Everyone exercising is a good idea. Mm. A lot of families are going out exercising together. Mm. I think that's a great thing to be doing. I think always when there's anxiety, any sort of breathing and relaxation sort of exercises, there's a lot of online uh, ways you can do that. So if you haven't already got some sort of routine of um, breathing and relaxing, then looking for something online. Um, being really intentional about self-care, whether that's uh, reading a book, whether that's doing some gardening, whatever that is for you, listening to music, being really intentional about looking after yourself mm. is really important. Um, playing games together. And I think don't have expectations that are too high. Mm. I think it's all harder. Everything is harder. Yep. Everything's a bit slower. Don't expect too much. Mm. Be easy on yourself. Mm. No, that's, that's really good advice, Jen. Uh, what about um, what about our kid? What about our kids? Like yeah. our kids, I know my kids have been picking up, um, you know, by just hearing uh, the word COVID nineteen. I think my four year olds run around going COVID nineteen, COVID nineteen, and he doesn't really understand what's going on. But I know um, I know uh, some kids in some families they're quite anxious yeah. about uh, everything that's going on. Like their routine has been messed up too. And um, what are some ways that we can help our kids? Um, when those times of anxiety comes for them? 
Mm, mm, good question. Because this is the time that kids, I think, are going to remember, mm, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I think it's, I, I think it is answering their questions. Okay. It's what do they know? What have they actually heard? Mm -hmm. And answering the questions that they have. Not answering the questions that you think they have, but answering the questions they do have. Um, maybe making sure what they're watching is um, appropriate sure. uh, on the media, you know, not too much news that's not appropriate. Um, empowering them with the knowing that um, actually they can do something. They can wash their hands a lot. Mm. They can cough and sneeze into their elbow. They actually can do something to stop this. Yeah, it's helpful. And they um, also reminding them that doctors and nurses and scientists are all working together to actually find a way out. So I think knowing that, knowing that people are working together to mm. keep them safe. Um, and they will cope better if we're coping better. So I think I come back to self-care again. They mm. will do better if we're actually doing okay. So look after mm. yourself. Yeah, no, that's great, Jen. And and particularly um, like tying all that back into uh, tr trusting that God is with us and he's, he's there and in control. I think all those tips that you've just given us there in looking after ourselves, looking after kids, if we've got kids, um, uh, have been really, really helpful. So thanks, okay. thanks for that. But um, just on the, the cottage side of things, how's, um, uh, how is the cottage there uh, to help during this time? So you guys are, aren't closed, you guys are open. Um, so how are you guys there to help at this time? Yep, yep. Yep, no, we, we've all gone online, meeting with clients all, online or on the phone, uh, our present clients and um, new clients online. And that's been such a blessing. Mm. It's just been amazing that we can still do that. And, and actually our clients have really been quite happy. They've been, they're just enjoying the fact that they can still connect with us. And actually it's been a good experience. So we are still meeting with clients. Um, and also if um, we've actually done Zoom uh, presentations on um, better ways of coping with isolation and COVID-19. Mm. So if you would like us to do that, we can also come and do that in your church with a group of people who are interested in that. Mm. So please don't, uh, please seek help. Please call us. We are here and uh, don't feel isolated on your own. Don't feel pain on your own and don't let your friend go through it on their own if they need some help. Mm. We are here and we would love to help. Mm. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks so much for coming in uh, today, Jen, and uh, and telling us a little bit about uh, the cottage and some ways that we can care for one another during this time. Uh, the cottage is there for you if you need it. Uh, please give the cottage a call. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're really thankful that you're there. Thanks a lot for coming in, Jen. You're welcome. You're welcome, Neil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to read the Bible for us. We're reading a passage from 1 Peter verses 1 to 2. Now it'll come up on the screen in front of you or you're welcome to grab out your own Bible. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Well, I wonder if you've ever found it hard being a Christian in this world today. And maybe your own personal circumstances have led to suffering that's caused you to question God's goodness in your life. Maybe you've seen things going on around the world and it's caused you to question God's purpose in this world. Maybe you yourself have suffered for calling yourself a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been mistreated or excluded with family or with work colleagues because you're a Christian. And if that's not your experience, I wonder what you would say to someone for whom that was their experience. They've been outcast by their work colleagues because they're a Christian. What would you say to them? What would you say to someone who's suffering 
because they're a Christian? What would you say to someone who says, you know what, it's just way too hard being a Christian in this world. I'm ready to give up and throw it all in. In the months of May and June, we're really excited to be checking out Peter's first letter in the New Testament. And what we're going to find is that this was exactly why Peter wrote his letter, to encourage the Christians of his day to stand firm in the faith despite their circumstances and the things that were going on around them. And Peter's going to raise things that require deep conviction in those who follow Jesus. Peter's going to raise things that help them to be those who stand fast till the end, trusting in Jesus, because they're going to face grief and they're going to face sufferings, he says. They're going to face trials and and pain. They're going to be mistreated like exiles living in a foreign land. And even when they do good, they're going to be persecuted for the good that they do in the name of Christ. Their situation in life will require deep conviction about their salvation. And especially when you consider the time that Peter wrote this letter. It's around 60 to 65 AD that he writes, right at the time of the Roman emperor named Nero. And understanding a little bit about Nero helps put in perspective the situation of these first Christians. Uh, If you know nothing about Nero, let me put you in the picture with the words of the Roman historian named Tacitus. He says this, Besides being put to death, they, that is Christians, were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clad in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs and others were crucified. Others set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when daylight failed. Nero had thrown open his grounds for the display and was putting on a show in the circus. All this gave rise to a feeling of pity, for it was felt that they were being destroyed, not for the public good, but to gratify the cruelty of an individual. That's Nero. That's the Roman emperor at the time when Peter writes this letter to them. And so he says to them in chapter 5, verse 12, which is a bit of an overview statement, he says, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. You see, the situation for these Christians that Peter writes to will require deep certainty of their salvation if they're to stand fast as Christians till the end. And that deep certainty will only come when they have a proper understanding of salvation. And this is where Peter starts. Peter, of course, uh, is a good man to listen to. He's an apostle, which means that he witnessed the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a good witness for us and for those he writes to. He was there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He was there when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb after being dead for three days. He was there on the mountain of transfiguration as Jesus and three of his disciples climbed that mountain and they heard the voice of God saying, this is my son, listen to him. He was there in the garden of Gethsemane as Jesus wept and prayed. He was a witness to Jesus' arrest and torture. He was a witness to his his death and his burial. Of course, we remember that during that time, he denied Jesus three times. But as he witnessed the empty tomb and as he met and spoke to the resurrected Jesus, his heart was transformed and changed. And then sometime after Jesus ascended into heaven, this same Peter stands up before thousands of people with great boldness and great conviction, calling people to repent and put their trust in Jesus. And on that day alone, over 3,000 people came to faith in Christ. And it's this Peter who ends up in Rome where he writes this letter to Christians who are in great need of encouragement, who are in great need of assurance in their faith and certainty of their salvation. And friends, I think that as a church, as we begin to look at this letter together, 
in our community groups during the week at church like this. And as we reflect further in the Rhythms podcast on some of the deep truths that we're going to hear throughout, I reckon God is going to strengthen our own convictions about who we are as the people of God, about how it is that we come to know and trust in this great God and about what it means to be those who follow Jesus in this world today. So let's get into it and have a look at verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These people who are, uh, we're told shortly, are chosen by God, are scattered. Scattered amongst these Roman provinces in what we would know as today's modern day Turkey. We're going to see this theme and the idea of them being exiles later in the letter. But let me give you a bit of a summary. The idea spiritually is that they're temporary residents, they're foreigners, they're they're aliens, strangers in this place because they don't belong to this world. They've been saved by the blood of Jesus. They've been called to a relationship with him. Heaven is their home. Spiritually, they're exiles. But what we're going to see is that actually physically and, and in reality, They're also exiles and treated this way too. They're excluded and marginalized. They're not quite uh, that of Roman citizens. They're suffering for the name of Christ. They're living in a place among people who aren't their own, strangers in the world. It was hard work living as a Christian in this hostile environment. And maybe you know that feeling. You know, that idea of your workplace being hostile towards Christians, maybe your family mocking you, friends mocking you, because they also are hostile towards the Christian faith. Maybe you've experienced something of that suffering for the name of Christ, that persecution for being a Christian, that idea of being a stranger in this place, an alien whose heaven is home. But in the meantime, we live in this strange place. Well, Peter starts here in his letter by reminding them of who they are. And it's a great reminder for us too. He says, To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Peter starts here with the origin of their salvation, the basis of their salvation. They are God's elect, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, it's not some random choice or ad hoc decision along the road of life and the journey that they've all of a sudden stumbled across God or God has stumbled across them. No, no, no. God knows them personally. And God has chosen them long before this time as part of his plan to be his people living in this world. Do you reckon that would be encouraging for these Christians as they face the the might of Nero and the Roman provinces around them? Christians living in the time of a lunatic like him to say, God has chosen you. Out of all the peoples of this earth, God has chosen you, that you are at the centre of God's plan, that he has set his love on you, that he's personally and perfectly chosen you before the beginning of time to be one of his elect chosen people. And so whatever circumstances you face, whatever the world might throw at you, however you might suffer, stand fast in the truth of the gospel because God has begun a work in you and will finish it. The origin of their salvation is God the Father. But how does God bring about that salvation in people who have turned their backs on him. Well, he goes on to say, again, verse 2, to God's elect who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the basis, how? Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Now, that word sanctify, it means to set apart or to make different. It's not a word that we actually use that much today, but it's something that we do often setting things apart, 
Let me give you two dumb illustrations, dumb just to make the point. First one, this is my MacBook. Uh, I bought it for my work purposes. It's no one else in my home is allowed to use it. My kids can't watch Netflix on it. They can't do their school projects on it. They're not allowed to touch it. It's been purchased and set apart for the purpose of serving me. Bit of a power, power control, I know. This one though, I'm sure you all do. This is uh, my toothbrush and I'm sure you've got one which you have sanctified for your use. That is, I've set it apart. My children don't use it. My wife doesn't use it. Its purpose is to clean my teeth and I have set it apart for my use only. See, we, we do it all the time. We sanctify things. We set them apart for a special purpose. And that's what Peter says here. He reminds them of how they became a part of God's people. And it wasn't through a persuasive preacher. And it's not their own good intentions or good works of heart. No, no, no. They became part of God's family because the Spirit has sanctified them. That the Spirit has set them apart. They now belong to God. And that is their purpose. Yeah, I wonder if I was to ask you how you became a Christian. You might rightly tell me that someone in your life pulled you aside and opened the Bible with you and began to introduce you to Jesus, that you were convicted of your own uh, sin and, and your own need to trust in Jesus. And it, it was all because that person read the Bible with you. And that, let me just say, is partly true. But, you know, there's a critical step that we sometimes miss when we tell our story, and it's this. Before any of that can happen and before our hearts can be at least open to hearing the good news of the gospel and our need for a saviour, the first step is the sanctifying work of the Spirit and His gracious act of enabling a sinner like me to even believe and respond at all. Because the Bible says that I was dead in my sin. The Bible says that my heart was hard and empty. But the sanctifying work of the Spirit begins when He begins to change that heart and soften that heart and fill that heart and make that heart that was once dead alive again. The origin of our salvation is God the Father who has chosen us. But we're told something here of how that becomes real and actual in our lives, how we actually experience the salvation of God in our lives. And that comes through the sanctifying work of the Spirit who marks us as different and sets us apart. And that's what Peter's saying here to these Christians. That despite what's going on around them, they're God's elect, chosen by God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. But why? But why has God done this? Why has God begun this work in the lives of these Christians at the time that Peter writes? What have they been chosen for? Well, again, verse 2, to God's elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the origin of salvation. How? Through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And why? To be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. They've been set apart for the purpose of obedience to Jesus. And we're not going to see it here in these opening two verses, but it'll become clearer as we make our way through this letter that Peter's written, that they're being called to be obedient to the commands of Jesus, to live in such a way that they're obeying his commands and making much of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You know, and just like the, the MacBook and the toothbrush have been set apart to serve me and me only, well, so Christians are set apart by God's Spirit for the purpose of serving Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, that phrase there, uh, which is a little bit interesting at the end of that verse, uh, sprinkled with his blood, usually we think of that phrase, particularly in the New Testament, in Hebrews and other books like that, as being forgiven or, or washed clean. And there's certainly that idea in the Bible. But I think Peter has something else in mind here. Now, in the Old Testament, if you look at Exodus 24 as an example, the sprinkling of, of blood 
wasn't about forgiveness or cleansing. It was about formalizing a covenant. That is, God chose Israel to be his special people, his treasured possession. And Israel said to God, we will obey you. We will do as we're told. We will follow your commands. And to to make that formal agreement, they sprinkled one another with blood to formalize that covenant relationship. Many years later, as Peter writes this letter, after the death and the resurrection and the ascending of Jesus into heaven, the idea of the sprinkling of Christ's blood formalizes the new covenant with God and his people. God has set his love on them, not just the Jewish nation of Israel, but now even Gentiles who are living in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia and even Narrabeen, that we too can hear by the work of God's spirit the truth of the gospel and respond. Sprinkled with blood is like the assurance, sealing the deal, establishing the new covenant between God and his people. And so Peter knows that these Christians he writes to need these deep truths deeply established within their hearts, that they're certain and true for them, and particularly this idea of salvation. And so he starts his letter in a real theologically heavy kind of way because he wants them to know that salvation is the work of God and God alone. It's not based on their performance. It's not based on the strength of how they'll respond in the face of suffering. It's not based on their, the record of their own good deeds. It relies on the sovereign choice of God in election and it's actualized through the work of the Holy Spirit in setting apart a people to God's service and it's established by the blood of Jesus. And friends, I think that's a great reminder for us too because we can so quickly be caught up in thinking that it's about me and my good works, about my performance on the spiritual field and how I go, how I'm reading my Bible and praying. They're all wonderful things, but they don't save us. It's only God in his sovereign choice through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to serve our Lord Jesus and be obedient to him. And I want to say to you that for some people, these ideas that we've discussed in today's message can be a little bit of a stumbling block. And I want to urge you this week, please to tune in to the Rhythms podcast because we're going to be delving in a little bit deeper, trying to break apart some of the questions that come up from the ideas of election and predestination and sanctification, some of the big items that have come in these first couple of verses of 1 Peter. So please tune in to the podcast this week, Rhythms, And we'd love to engage further with you about that. Because as we study God's word, we're reminded of truths that are really important for us in our life. If we want to be those who hold fast and stand firm until the end. 1 Peter was written to encourage Christians with these wonderful truths and comforting truths. And I hope that in the next few months, as we dig in a little bit deeper to these things, and this part of God's word, that it will shape not just what you hear, but what you believe. Not just what you believe, but how you live in light of God's sovereign choice in choosing you to be one of his people. It'll bring great assurance as we continue to be those who live for the obedience of Jesus and follow him in our world. Stand fast and let me pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit would guide us over the coming few months as we look at this part of your word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help those of us who are teaching to be faithful in what we teach, truthful, that you would help us to be transformed by what we hear in your word in the months ahead. We thank you that salvation is your work and your work alone. Help us to be comforted by these truths, and as we're challenged by them, that we might live for the obedience of Christ our Saviour. 
We pray that you might continue to sanctify us, change us into the likeness of your son so that we might bring him glory and honour in each of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the dark your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken
How encouraging was church this week? One Peter could not have come at a better time to know that we have a living hope in our God and that he loves us and is ready to comfort us whenever we need. After church this week, we're going to be doing a Zoom chat room. And that just means that we're all going to be gathering together and encouraging one another and just getting to know each other. So we would love for you to come along to that. Also, if you are in need of any help at this time, our St Faith's care team is on hand and ready to help you. So if you just click the COVID-19 button and then fill out the form, we'll be in contact with you as soon as possible. Along with this, if you would like to be in contact with a ministry staff member, please just write in the comments of that form that you would like to do that and we'll also get in touch with you as soon as we can. All right, that's it for St Faith's this week. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope that you have a great week to come and we'll see you soon. See you later.